All right, so before we get started, a little um, TMI. <laughs> um, I have been struggling uh, with anxiety for the past couple of months, like pretty crippling anxiety, especially in the beginning. And um, this study has helped me a lot, and um, I'm hoping that it can help you as well. I tell you because if I seem a little off, it might be that. Um, also, to, your homework is going to be to pray for me. And, um, and uh, it fits right in with the class, so it, it works, right? Um, so I just wanted you to kind of know that um, before we get started. Now, uh, when I sat down to start preparing for this class, all I had to go by was the title, A Study in Prayer and Bible Study. Um, and so I thought, okay, um, what am I going to do with this, right? Prayer seems like something that we could probably talk a lot about. Bible study, I wasn't exactly sure how that fit in, but the more I got into it, the more I saw that these really aren't two separate topics, that they go together um, very, very well, um, hand in glove, if, if you will. Uh, so I'm excited to share that with you. Um, this class tonight is going to be an introductory class. We're just going to, like, at a high level, um, why are we studying prayer? Why are we studying Bible study? How do they relate? And then I'll, I'll let you, at the end of the class, I'll let you know how the class is going to unfold. Um, so with that, we'll just jump right in. Why prayer? Um, so when I thought, how am I going to answer the question, why are we studying prayer right now? Um, the first place I thought to go to was to look to Jesus. He talked about prayer. He prayed. He, he taught his disciples how to pray. I feel like there's a lot that you can learn from Jesus when it comes to prayer. And so let's, let's take a look and see what we find here. Um, so, who has Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 and 6? I can read that for us. All right, so this is Jesus. He's, he's about to tell them um, the Lord's Prayer, right? Give them the model prayer. Um, and he's, so he's talking about prayer in chapter 6 and uh, as a way of teaching his disciples. He says, do not pray like hypocrites um, because they want to be seen by others. And that's really the reward they're going to get out of it. They're going to pray in a public way for other people to see them and say, oh, look how religious they are. Look how pious or righteous or whatever it is. That's the, that's the end of the reward, right, that they're going to get out of their prayers. Um, but Jesus tells his disciples and us that in, we need to pray in secret. My first question for you tonight is, what do you think is the purpose of praying in secrecy? Why, why secrecy? Why is Jesus telling us this? What do we get out of that? Any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So not for show and also to help you focus. Did I hear somebody over here? Oh, same thing. Okay, yeah, no interference. Um, especially those of you who have little kids, I'm sure you've been interrupted during prayer a lot. Yeah, and that's a big one for me. Uh, that's something that I learned in the course of this class is actually praying out loud. So what I've started doing is 
early in the morning or late at night, I'll take a walk in the neighborhood and I'll actually pray out loud. And it, and it, it is freeing, too, to, to be able to say things and not worry about who's hearing you. Uh, Jim? Yeah. yeah, that's a big one, because if you never prayed in secret, then you would be less likely to confess those sins, right? Because you're going to want to keep them. That's a great point. Any other thoughts? Um, so think about this. Um, uh, well, actually, I'm going to hold that point to the end. Let's move on to the next passage. Who has Mark 1 that can read that point? Okay, so this is the beginning of, of Christ's ministry, right? And he's working tirelessly. And remember when the woman touched the hem of his garment and he felt the power go out of him? So now think about every single person in the, in the town, in the surrounding areas, coming to be healed or to bring their loved ones to be healed or to have demons cast out or et cetera, et cetera. If he can feel the power flowing from this woman touching his garment, got to be something that he's feeling when he's, um, you know, healing these people and casting out. It's, it's, in other words, it takes effort. And sometimes, um, I'm sure you've experienced this, if you've had an emotional day where you maybe haven't done a lot physically, but there's been a lot of emotion in your day, don't you feel tired at the end of the day? So he's got this physical thing that's happening with the power that's flowing from him, and he, I mean, no one loves us like Jesus. So he's seeing these people suffer, some, some who have suffered all their lives, some who are suffering from these, these you know, demons that are just wreaking havoc, and he's feeling emotional. So he's probably exhausted at the end of the day. Um, he healed many who were sick, and he cast out many demons. And so at the end of the day, he goes back to wherever he's camped, and he goes to bed, and he's like, I'm sleeping late tomorrow, right? I'm, I'm, I'm white. I can't do that again. Right? No. What does it say actually he does? It says he rose very early the next morning to pray. Um, and uh, so my question is, why did Jesus seek a desolate place? And why did he do it very early in the morning? I think there's some huge significance to that. Any thoughts? Quiet, so a desolate place for, for the quiet. Oops, sorry, I forgot my mic. Any other thoughts? Well, some people, yeah. Uh, I don't know about mine. <laughs> yes, I think that might be true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like to think of it as prayer is the engine that drives his ministry, right? It is not a side effect. Jesus didn't, you know, when we talk about this, and we will talk about this in this class about, you know, you know you're at a stoplight and you say a quick prayer. Some people think of them as like arrows, you know, shooting an arrow up to God, saying a quick prayer. Something happens in the moment, you say a prayer. Those things are fine, and we'll talk about that. They have their place. But prayer wasn't a side effect. Jesus. He wasn't going about his ministry and then, oh, oh, I better pray about this. Or something comes up, oh, I better pray about that. He prayed about his ministry before he got to work. 
And we're going we're gonna to see as we go through this class what those prayers probably looked like in terms of how he addressed God, how he praised God, how he was thankful, you know, all of those kinds of things, asking for guidance and direction. But it was, it was a priority, to your point, Corey, right? To get up first thing in the morning, before I do work for my Lord, I'm going to go to him in prayer. Um, any other thoughts on why the desolate place? Quieter. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And and in fact, you you've nailed it. Um my point uh, and this slide is Jesus teaches us that prayer is all about a personal relationship with God. That's exactly right. No, I'm not saying that. Um, I'm just saying that I've recently been praying out loud and I have found it to be helpful. You can't always do it. Um, but for me, well, and this is, this is weird for me too, and I told you guys that I was struggling with anxiety. Like, this is also how I work through my anxiety. And I talk to God just like I would talk to a, a dear friend and tell him about what's going on. And for some reason, there's more power in it for me when I hear myself say it out loud. Um, sometimes when you confess, to Jim's point, like, it's hard to say out loud. Like, it's easier to maybe think, forgive me for this thing I did, but to say what it is you did, it's hard for me. And I, I find that helps me if I can get through that. But I don't know that it's necessarily better. Uh, it all depends. Yes. Yes. No, I, I completely agree with that. And so the trick is to develop a really strong prayer habit uh, and take advantage of what, like, don't waste the crisis, I think is the saying, right? Take advantage of those dark moments to really build that habit and draw close to God. Um, and, and back to the um, sort of privacy thing, I have a note here that says privacy fosters honesty and honesty fosters a relationship. How can we pray freely and openly with God when there are others nearby who may disturb us and listen to us pray at any moment? And I also think about it like, think about when you first met your spouse. And maybe it was, I know for me, I met Maggie at, at UofL and it was in a class setting and I talked to her when the class was around, when we were waiting. We, we waited in this certain area before class would start. Talking to her in that setting was great, but I couldn't wait to just talk to her just to be me and her, and to say things that I didn't want the rest of the class to hear. And the reason for that is because I wanted to be in a relationship with her. And it's the same thing with God. We need to want to be in a relationship with him and seek that private time to talk to him and in a more intimate way. 
Um, before I move on, I want to go back to this idea that prayer was the engine that drove Christ's ministry. Um, I don't have a slide for this, unfortunately, but um, there, there's a couple of uh, examples that I wanted to bring out. In Luke 4, uh, after Jesus was baptized, he spent 40 days praying in the wilderness. After this, after this he, he was tempted by Satan, and then he began his public ministry. So Jesus used prayer to prepare for a major task. He was preparing for his ministry 40 days in prayer, right? Um, in Mark 6, he used prayer to recharge after hard work. He sent the 12 disciples out to do ministry. When they returned, he encouraged them to separate from the people who were following them. Separate um, and, and pray to recharge. In Matthew 14, after he had learned that his cousin John the Baptist had been beheaded, he went away by himself to pray. He used prayer as a way to work through grief with God. Um, Luke 6, um, early in his ministry, Jesus spent the whole night alone in prayer. Why? Because the next day, he picked the 12 disciples. Um, Luke 22, hours before he was arrested and went to Mount Olives and uh, went a short distance away from his disciples to pray, he was in great emotional agony knowing what was about to happen. So he used prayer to get him through a time of distress. Um, and then my last point, Luke 5. Uh, it, Luke 5, 16 just says that he spent time alone in prayer. He went to desolate places to prayer. So he actually took the time to focus on prayer. So preparing for a major task, recharging from the work that you're doing, working through grief, um, making important decisions, working through times of trials and distress and focusing on prayer. Prayer is important. It was important to Jesus, and it should be important to us. Uh, any final thoughts on this before we move on? Mary? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think your, your mind works on problems even while you're asleep. So you might have actually new insights on, on things when you wake up. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, who has Matthew 21? All right, so this is the story of the cursed fig tree. Um, figs rarely appear before there are leaves on a tree. Mark tells us that this was out of season for, for figs, so it, it probably means that the tree was an early bloomer because Jesus was hungry and he saw the tree, it had leaves, so he went over to get the fruit. Um, but there was no fruit. And what did he do? He cursed it immediately and it withered. Um, why do you think the disciples marveled at this? This really stood out to me when I was reading this. Don't you think they've seen some stuff that's probably more impressive than him withering up a fig tree? Any thoughts on that? Miracles never got old? <laughs> well, I mean, we had, they must have seen him heal a lot of people and cast out a lot of demons. They've seen him turn water to wine. Like, what was it, do you think, about this fig tree? Okay, that's a good point. He didn't make figs appear. He actually withered the whole thing. So there was this idea of judgment that came along with it, right? Was somebody else going to say? Okay. Yeah, I think that might be it. Um, seeing, seeing. The power in the inverse probably was a little bit off-putting, like caught him off guard. Um, two, this made me wonder, like, 
they could they could be used to it. Um, I think sometimes we get used to God's blessings in our own life, and there are things that we ought to be marveling at that we're not. Um, certainly, if we feel like God is working in a in our life in a way that is not pleasant, it might have that same jarring effect of seeing him wither up the tree. Uh, and certainly, uh, if he if we're being disciplined, um, that that is a possibility. Um, but there's a greater point here. This is just this is beyond the tree and the, the physical tree. The tree here represents Israel, and um, God's chosen Israel should have borne fruit, just as this tree should have borne fruit because it had leaves, but it didn't. And so this miracle is actually foreshadowing judgment. On Israel, and the reason I want to make sure to bring this up, um, because Jesus is using this to make a point about faith, and not necessarily about prayer. Um, because a lot of times we read this passage and we go, "Oh, well, if I prayed for a thing and it didn't happen, I didn't have enough faith, right? I have to. If I believe it, if I believe." pray, and we'll, we'll all instantly be in our new building, it'll, it'll happen. But we know it doesn't work that way. Um, and so Jesus is really making more a point about faith and less a point about prayer. And um, why do you think, let me back up. He, when he said this mountain, he was talking about the temple mount. That Jerusalem was built on. And if you pray that this mount be cast into the sea, in other words, the old law be done away with and the new law come into effect, and have faith, it will happen. And there is a lesson there that we're going to hammer home time and time again in this class around alignment with God's will. When you pray, it is important to be aligned to God's will. If you're praying, with faith, in a way that aligns to his will, there is literally no limit to what can be done. And this is what he's saying here. And, he, and he's telling them this. I'm just going to answer the question there that I have at the, at the bottom. He's telling them this because he's about to leave them. And he's afraid that they're going to lose heart because they're going to be, um, they're going to be persecuted, they're going to be challenged, it's going to be hard. And he doesn't want them to lose faith. Um, if they continue to pray, believing that God's will will be done, it will be done. Sorry, that felt a little clumsy. Anybody have any thoughts on this? Maybe it can help me to be a little clearer. Yeah. Didn't have enough faith. Yes, prayer. Yeah. Yeah, I think the point here about the mountain being cast in the sea is that it's not it's not their prayer that's doing it, it's God that's doing it. Their prayer connects them to that God who can do those things. And so the, the main takeaway here that I wanted us to come away with this is that prayer with faith is powerful. You pray to God. You have faith in God, not necessarily in the thing that you're asking for. I have faith that it will happen. 
but you have faith in the one who could make it happen, that's where the power is. Um, okay, let's move on. Uh, who has Luke 9? Oh, did I not write the, sorry. Okay, so here we have transfiguration. And surprise, surprise, Jesus finds a secluded spot to pray. That's kind of his thing, right? Um, and this is soon after he told the disciples uh, about his death. and so. While he was praying, his appearance changes. And my question is, what did the disciples notice first? What change did they notice first? His face, right? Um, Luke talks about they saw his glory. Um, his, his clothing became dazzling white. Matthew adds that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. Uh, and Mark talks about his clothes being radiant, intensely white as no one on earth could, could ever bleach fabric to be. Um, everything about his appearance changed, but they noticed his face changed first, his glory. They saw his glory. And um, I, th I just find that interesting because that happened while he was praying. And if you think about it, same thing can happen to us, not literally. Your face isn't going to start shining when you pray. But if you pray in a consistent manner, in a manner that is aligned with God's will, if you're doing it because you want a relationship with Him, if you're doing it because you have faith in Him, and you're consistent in that, your life is going to change. And your life will reflect His glory. So in that way, you will be transfigured. You will be changed. Prayer has the power to do that for us. Uh, any thoughts on that? Okay, who has Luke 22? Okay, so this is Gethsemane. And what's the first thing Jesus do? He finds a secluded spot to pray. That's his thing. <laughs> that helps him have a relationship with God. Um, this is right before his crucifixion. He shows great humility and submission to God. During this. Because remember, he is God. He could call down 10,000 angels. There's a lot that he could do to avoid this. He does not want to do this. But he submits himself to God. Um, and this is, this is impressive because of his extreme agony. I don't know. Hopefully, you haven't been through extreme agony in your life. But if you have, um, you know how easy it would be to take the, the first opportunity to, to make the pain go away. Um, but Jesus withstands it all because he knows it's his Father's will. Um, what do you think happened during this prayer? Or what did, sorry, what happened during this prayer? Not what do you think? It's there in the, in the passage. What did God do for Jesus during this prayer? He sent an angel down. So there are two places where we see an angel being sent to help Jesus. And I contend that they're both moments of temptation. The first one we know about. This one, I don't know if we often think about it as temptation, but I, I believe that Jesus was strongly tempted not to go through with it. But he withstood that temptation, and an angel was sent um, to comfort him. I find that very interesting. I have prayed many times <clears throat> for God to send his angels to help me, to fight my spiritual battles. 
to encamp around me like we read in the, in the Psalms to protect me. And I believe uh, wholeheartedly that he does that. Um, the Hebrew writer says that are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? He says that of angels. So I don't know how it works, but I ask for it. <laughs> um, because I know that it does work. Yeah? He encourages them what? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. They should be doing the things that they've seen him do all along, which is prepare for things through prayer, but they don't really fully understand what's coming, do they? Any other thoughts? Prayer transforms us. So Jesus, the thing that Jesus teaches us about prayer, and the reason why we're studying prayer this quarter, is because prayer builds a relationship with God. Prayer develops faith. God who can do all things, and it transforms us. And um, so we're going to be digging deeper into that and figuring out how we can take advantage of that. All right, so let's talk about Bible study. Why are we, are we doing Bible study at the same time we're doing prayer? Uh, who has Proverbs that can read that for us? Okay, so in this proverb, we, are, we learn about the value of wisdom. Um, we know proverb is a book that gives us practical guidance on, on how to live our lives. It leads us to success and fulfillment, and it brings us closer to God. Um, so my first question for you is, what must we do to achieve these things? What must we do to have success, fulfillment, and be closer to God? Not a trick question. What's that? Have faith and ask for it? Absolutely, that's true. Have to be open. Open to learning, okay. No, that's perfect. Repeatedly is a very important word in that sentence, right? Um, I mean, let's look, let's look at the prerequisites to these things that are listed in this passage right now. Receive his word. You got to read. Read the word. You got to hear it. Read it. Repeatedly expose yourself to it. That's receiving the word. You got to treasure up his commandments, it says in Proverbs. Make notes. Um, and and um, leave them around the house. Um, that, that's something that we found helpful, especially when the girls were little, um, to put specific notes like on their bathroom mirror or on the door that would leave the house or wherever. Um, Make your ear attentive. Pay attention. Just read to check off on your daily Bible reading that you did it. Like, pay attention. What is it saying? What does it say to you? How does it... And let me tell you, you can read the same passage um, once a month, and it will probably have a different shade of meaning. Certainly, every year as you grow older, the shades of meaning are change, or, or you become more mature or have experienced more in life to where you go, oh, I didn't see it that way before. Um, so pay attention. Call out for insight and understanding, it says in Proverbs. That sounds a lot like prayer, doesn't it? Well, already we're seeing the relationship between prayer and Bible study. Um, seek it like silver. Keep studying. Read the Word. Make notes. Pay attention. Pray. Study. Rinse. Repeat. Um, what does God give us in return if we do these things? Not a trick question. Blessings, yeah, but specifically wisdom and knowledge. So why do we study the Bible? Wisdom and knowledge. You want wisdom and knowledge? That's, that's a good thing, right? You want that? Yes, we all want that. Study. Um, all right. 
Next passage. Who has Joshua? Yes. Okay, so this passage tells us a lot about the importance of God's word. God specifically tells jo uh, Joshua to lead his people, right? And he tells him he must be strong and courageous. He has to be careful to follow the law that Moses uh, delivered. And that the law must not depart from his mouth. How is he going to accomplish this? How is Joshua going to, Joshua going to accomplish this? Being strong and courageous, following the law, and not letting it depart from his mouth. He has to know it. Is that what I heard? Yeah. Maybe we should do this class early in the morning when everybody's mind is fresh. That's right. You have to know. He has to. If if the law is never going to depart from his mouth, he has to know the law like pretty intimately. Um, if he's going to be careful to follow it. He has to know it pretty intimately, right? If he wants to be strong and courageous, where's he going to go during those moments when he doesn't feel up to the task? He's going to go to the Word. He's going to go to God in prayer. Those are the things that you do to build up that strength and courage because the strength and courage is not in yourself. It's supplied by God. Um, so if he does these things, what's his reward? God says that he will make his way prosperous. He will grant him good success, and that he will always be with him. Um, who here wants to be prosperous, prosperous, successful, and have God always be with them? Always. Okay, so how do you do that? Study and pray. Yes. Um, do you think about studying in this way? When you sit down to study your Bible, do you think, I am going, this is going to make me prosperous? Do you think this is going to make God's, this is going to put me in God's presence? Do you think about that? I mean, I, I know I, I, I try to now. I haven't always in my life thought of it in that way, but that's what this passage is telling us. When we study his word, this is what the outcome. All right, I need to speed up. Prosperity and success. So why are we studying? Um, prayer and Bible study together. Um, we have a few minutes. Oh, go ahead. That's right. That's both sides of the, the, the conversation, right? Um, okay, so let's look at that. that. That's a great point. Let's look at that a little bit closer in this last slide here. Um, the results of Bible study and their effect on our prayer life, is it gives you content for your prayers. It helps you align your prayers with God's purposes and desires. It provides you with the language to express your thoughts and feelings to God. And it teaches you how to pray more effectively. Hopefully you'll see all of that as we study this topic throughout the quarter. But I can 100% guarantee you that those things are true. Um, in terms of what to pray for and what words to use, if you haven't spent much time in the Psalms, and I know we did just do a Psalms class, but if you haven't, I encourage you, I mean, like, just read it always. Just as soon as you hit the last one, go to the first one again and keep going. Every day, read, read the Psalms. And steal, like, plagiarize from David. Steal the language. I promise you, when you're reading, you will feel some of the things that he says. You will say, how does David know that that's the way I feel? I'm going to use those words when I talk to God. Um, when it comes to aligning yourself with God's purposes and desires, with His will, that's the only place you're going to find it. So, um, prayer has a, or Bible study has a profound effect on our prayers, and the, the inverse is true as well. 
the more you pray, uh, the deeper your understanding of the Bible. Because it's, it's not just a one-way conversation with God. God is speaking to you. He's speaking to you in his word, but I believe that he's speaking to you in other ways as well. And you just you have to be open to that. You have to be um, paying attention. But if you pray for things, if you pray for wisdom, if you pray for guidance, if you pay for insight, um, God's going to give it to you. And it won't be James Earl Jones' voice or whoever you like coming from the clouds. I guess that's Mufasa. Um, <laughs> this is the path you should take. Um, he does speak to you. He does guide you. And you have to be open to that. You have to open your heart to that. Prayer will help you with that. <clears throat> And it might lead you to parts of the Bible to go actually study. Because as you pray, you learn things from God. He sends you in a direction you need more study. Um, we gain insights into the text that we might, not, we might have otherwise missed the more we pray. Um, it gives us an avenue to seek guidance and understanding and obedience. I mean, because often we can pray about the study that we just have, right? It's not, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. And then it helps us to actively apply what we learn. So you read something about God's will, you see that it's missing in your life, you do your best to implement it, and you pray for help to do that. And when you mess up, you confess, you ask for more guidance, you go back and you study some more, and it's a cycle. And it builds on it, you mature as you do that. Any thoughts on this in the last couple of minutes that we have? On this or just anything we've talked about? Yeah. 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 Um, thank you, and, and thanks for that comment. Um, you know, I keep going back to this whole relationship idea, right? And if you if you wanted to have a relationship with someone. Um, and you found out that they had written a book, I bet you'd go out and buy that book. And I bet you'd read it. I bet you'd read it probably more than once, trying to get some insight into this person you're trying to have a relationship with. Show that you have interest in him or her, right? It's the same thing that's happening here. Uh, God wrote a book. We can read it and learn about him, and we can talk to him through prayer. Show him what we've learned and ask him to help us learn more. Um, okay, so this is the way the class is going to shake out. Um, lessons two through um, six are going to be prayer-based. And my last quarter class helped me make a few tweaks to this, so hopefully it'll flow uh, pretty well. Then starting um, in lesson seven through lesson ten, we're going to talk about Bible study. In lessons 9 and 10, I'm going to do something that we've never done before, where I'm going to actually show you something on the computer. So I'll probably be standing back there, connecting to the overhead, talking to you as I'm showing you stuff on the computer. And then lessons 11 and 12 are more like application. So after having studied prayer and Bible study, how do you really implement that in your life? Um, and that's all I have. I think the, the bell may have just rung. So. Thank you for uh, your participation. I appreciate it.